Welcome to Calling a City to Life, a podcast by Queen's Park Baptist Church in Glasgow. Each week you'll hear from us two episodes, the talk and the chat. First up is the talk, and that's the audio version of this week's sermon as preached at Queen's Park Baptist. So this is your opportunity to listen to it again or to listen to it for the first time. And later on in the week, you'll be able to tune in again and download the chat where we gather around and discuss in a bit more detail some of the issues and themes raised in this week's talk. Thank you for tuning in to the talk. We hope you enjoy it. And we look forward to you tuning in again later in the week. Enjoy. Welcome to those of you who are joining us uh, online or at some point morning, noon, night, whatever, are listening on the podcast. Hasn't it been fantastic this morning to witness and celebrate? I always get emotional at baptisms. I get emotional at everything, actually. To witness um, baptisms of people at different ages, different stages. And that word witness is important, isn't it? We've heard a witness. We've, We've heard a testimony of what God is done and is continuing to do in lives. And this morning, just want to take a, a moment just to think about, well, what is it that they're witnessing to? What is it that we are celebrating? What have we witnessed this morning? And to do that, we're going to turn to Romans 6. The words will be in the screen. I'm going to use the, the, the message translation uh, this morning because I think the way that Eugene translates it for us as helpful. So, so what do we do? Keep on sinning so that God can keep on forgiving? I should hope not. We've left the old country where sin is sovereign. How can we still live in our old houses there? Or don't you realize we packed up and left there for good? That's what happened in baptism. When we went under the water, we left the old country of sin behind. When we came out of the water, we entered into the new country of grace, a new life in a new land. That's what baptism into the life of Jesus means. When we're lowered into the water, it's like a burial of Jesus. And when we're raised up out of the water, it's like the resurrection of Jesus each of us raised into a light-filled world by our Father so that we can see where we're going in our new grace-sovereign country. Could it be any clearer? Our old way of life was nailed to the cross with Christ, a decisive end to that sin-miserable life, no longer captive to sin's demands. What we believe is this. If we get included in Christ's sin-conquering death. So we also get included in his life-saving resurrection. We know that when Jesus was raised from the dead, it was a signal of the end of death as the end. Never again will death have the last word. When Jesus died, he took sin down with him, but alive he brings God down to us. From now on, think of it this way. Sin speaks a dead language and it means nothing to you. God speaks your mother tongue and you hang on every word. You're dead to sin and alive to God. That's what Jesus did. That means you must not give sin a vote in the way that you conduct your lives. Don't give it the time of day. Don't even run little errands that are connected with that old way of life. Throw yourselves, throw yourselves wholeheartedly and full time. Remember, you've been raised from the dead into God's way of doing things. Sin can't tell you how to live. After all, you're not living under that old tyranny any longer. You're living in the freedom of God. Amen. Famously, it's the Apostle Peter who in his second epistle and it says, this guy Paul, he's a bit hard to understand at times. And certainly the book of Romans gets that reputation, doesn't it? It's a bit dense, it's a bit hard to understand. But I think we're helped in understanding Paul if we get to grips with some of his key concepts. 
For Paul, the human race is held in slavery. We're held captive and controlled by two great powers. Powers which we are powerless to defeat or escape from on our own. And these two great powers are death and sin. For sure, there's a myriad of other powers. Racism, greed, violence, and so the list could go on. But these other powers are in the service and work to keep us in captivity and experience the loss and the destructiveness of death and sin. For Paul, death is not just what happens to all living things, including you and I, at the end of our lives. Death's an everyday occurrence. The idea of a zombie has become kind of like popular in contemporary culture. We host the Park Run Cafe. Did you know there's such, there's such a thing as zombie runs? Remember, zombies run in straight lines. So if you're running from a zombie, you zigzag because you can escape them that way. Now, Paul's not describing zombies of our pop horror culture. But he is saying that living without Christ, we experience death in such a way that we are something like a living dead. Death despoils all aspects of life. It's death which is at work when you try and do something nice and rather than that person be blessed, you know what, it, it goes wrong, it lands wrongly and where you'd hoped that this would strengthen that friendship, do you know what, things now feel a bit awkward, you feel a bit rejected. Death's body, sin creates an environment where death works its destruction. Sin works away and under its power we sin. We participate in activities of rebellion against God, resisting what he wants to do in our lives. We participate in anti-life, anti-love, anti-hope, anti-goodness, anti-holiness activities, which means that under its power, even when we try and do something good, often it's tainted by death. I grew up with a saying, a saying that probably many of you grew up with as well. An apple a day keeps the doctor away. Now, I'm not a big fan of apples, but on occasion I will eat an apple to try and be healthy, or at least give the appearance of being healthy. Now, if like me, you don't have an orchard or a garden, maybe you don't even have a garden at all, then you need to go and buy your apples from the shop. Now, this is not to depress you all. But try and do that in a way that at no point we are complicit or involved in a chain of labor exploitation, land exploitation, climate change inducing greenhouse gases that transported the apple from New Zealand, probably, to our country. Never mind insecticides and pesticides that have... Uh, killed the insects which the birds need to eat and which then pollute and poison soil and water supply. In our sin-dominated world, nutritional goodness of my shop-bought apple is tainted by the imperfect, sin-affected system which allowed me to buy it. If that's depressing, then the good news is the good news. The New Testament writers tell of how God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit deal and defeat the problem and chaos these powers, and in particular the powers of death and sin cause. And in Romans 6, we have Paul weaving this all together in what we are witnessing to and what happens in baptism. Now, Paul's not the first person to tell this story I always feel as though the choir should come up and start to kind of like sway and sing, Susan. DreamWorks tell this story in the film The Prince of Egypt. No way. They got the story from somewhere else, didn't they? I mean, this is the story that's told in the Exodus. You know that story, don't you? Pharaoh enslaves God's people. 
They're trapped by Pharaoh's power and the system he has established results that they experience oppression and death every day of their lives. And God provides not only a way of escape from slavery and the dominion of Pharaoh through the waters of the Red Sea, but he also defeats Pharaoh and his army so the people cannot be re-enslaved to remain or be put back under his power. Having been freed from Pharaoh and crossed the Red Sea, the people are not only in a new location, in the promised land, but they're under new rule. They're led by God under his love and provision. He is their loving ruler. Not a ruler in the mold of Pharaoh, but as a father. The great German theologian Karl Barth in his dogmatics and outline reminds us of the dangers of us, experience, of us projecting onto God our experience of our earthly fathers. Our father may have been great, may have been terrible, but God is so much better than even our greatest father. Bart says, true and proper fatherhood resides in God and from his fatherhood of God that we know as fatherhood among men and women is derived. The historical account of God's liberation of his people, which we read of the book of Exodus, tells us not just of what God did in ancient history. It's a, a theological allegory, a prefiguring of what God has done for the whole of humankind in and through Christ. His incarnation, his being with us, his death and resurrection, his ascension to the Father. Pharaoh is like the powers of sin and death to enslave and control and oppress. God freed his people from Pharaoh and led them out of ancient Egypt. But he did more than that. God defeated Pharaoh and his power destroyed the army which chased his people. They couldn't be brought back under his control. And that's a dramatic and wonderful picture of what God has done for us. Praise God that he is still in the business of liberation, of setting free and of destroying the powers which lead to death and oppression and captivity. God in Christ Jesus frees us from the power of sin and death. And he has not just freed us, but he has defeated and destroyed those powers. And God, by his Spirit, relocates us from Egypt, not physical Egypt, but as Paul puts it in Romans 6, he relocates us from the country where sin and death are in control into the promised land, the new country of grace in Christ. You're living in a new land. The new location we have, the house that God offers us to move to, is Jesus. In verse 3 of the passage we read, Paul says we are baptized into the life of Jesus. This is our crossing of the Red Sea. This is our freedom, our exodus from being captive to sin's demands and death's reign over us. True life. Life which overcomes death and does not live under its control or in its fear is only found in Jesus. Because he's the one who has the victory. Paul writes, when we were lowered into the water, it was like the burial of Jesus. When we're raised out the water, it's like the resurrection of Jesus. Now, as I said, I'm using the message translation because I think Peterson is helpful here. And certainly, going under the water is like a burial. But to be buried, well, you would hope that you were dead, wouldn't you? It'd be a bit of a nightmare if you're buried alive. And so Paul doesn't actually use the word buried here. He uses the Greek word for death, thanatou, not thanapsa. We're dead 
And this distinction is important. Because we're not merely buried into a burial like Jesus. We're buried into his death. And because we're united in Christ, we're included in his death. I have already died. And this is the best news ever. This is good news. Because being united in Christ, being included in his death, means we're also included in what? In his resurrection. That is our hope. That's why we don't leave people in the water to drown. We lift them back up. Paul, in his most sustained writing on the resurrection in 1 Corinthians 15, ends that great passage with these famous words, words we've actually already sung in one sense. Death has been swallowed up in victory. Where, O oh death, is your victory? Where, O oh death, is your sting? The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Death has been defeated because God raised Jesus from the dead to resurrection life. Death has been defeated and we're included in Jesus' death and resurrection means that death has lost its grip on us. It can't hold us captive anymore. There is, of course, the resurrection of our bodies that we look forward to at the end of this age. And it's then that death's defeat is made clear because death and sin will be no more. But just there are many deaths we and the world and creation experience now, so there is a resurrection now. Resurrection power now, which overcomes death and allows us to experience a newness of life now. Real life. Jesus shaped and powered life. One day, we will experience the resurrection. But what today Faith and Gordon and Jerry have witnessed to is that we also know a resurrection in our body as we are made alive by God's Spirit and empowered to live as his children. The life we live by the Spirit is not just life in Jesus, but life of Jesus. And that means transformation. We're changed. It means our life starts to speak of Jesus. It starts to become Jesus-shaped. But what does a Jesus-shaped, Jesus-speaking life look like? Well, helpfully, Paul tells us in verses 12 to 14, don't keep giving sin a vote in the way you live your life. The resurrection life we live now empowers us to say no to sin controlling us. Now, saying no to sin is, of course, not the same as saying we will not sin. Our living in Christ doesn't mean that God evacuates us from this world where the powers of sin and death are still at work. Rather, now, I'm not much of a golfer. But it is like a ball that is hit perfectly towards the hole. It's always destined to be a hole in one because it's been hit perfectly. But it's not hole in one until it arrives in that, bo- that hole. And so we have been set on a trajectory. Everlasting life. Holy life with God. But we travel through this sin and death contaminated world. Yet we know that just as that ball is struck and will end up in the hole, so God works in us. We share Paul's confidence that God who began a good work in us will complete it. Saying no to sin means that we run to and after Jesus. I love the way that Peterson puts it 
Throw yourselves wholeheartedly and full time into God's way of doing things. Sin can't tell you how to live. After all, you're not living under that old tinnery. Old, yeah, any longer. You're living in freedom of God. Jesus gives us the answer to the question, well, what's God's way of doing things? Living life in God's way of doing things means living in obedience to God's leading, his character, his commands. Just as those held captive in Egypt were freed so that they could worship God and live for him, so we likewise have been freed so that instead of worshipping false idols, ourselves, consumerism, whatever, we can worship God and live for him in truth and empowered by the Spirit. That's why when Jesus summarizes for us what it means to live in God's way of life, he says, love the Lord your God from your whole heart, from your whole self, from your whole intelligence and your whole strength. Wholehearted, whole life, full time worshipping God. That's how we're called to live. But God didn't just call his people or lead his people out of Egypt so that they could worship him to have a nice, cozy time all together. He freed them that through their worship and through their right living, they might be a blessing to all nations. And God's mission for his people has not changed. He invites us into Jesus, telling us to love God by loving our neighbors as we love ourselves. Martin Luther, the great 15th century theologian and troublemaker, said, We love God who we cannot see by loving loving those around us who we can see. Living in God's way of doing things means we live Jesus-shaped lives. And to say Jesus-shaped life is to equally say cross shaped. We're called to live Jesus' cross-shaped life. That's a bit of a tongue twister. Life that participates in Christ's overcoming of death by not being purveyors of death, but carriers of God's life. Lives that participate in Christ's victory over sin by choosing to seek first his kingdom and not willfully participate in that which we know is sinful and not of his kingdom. Cross-shaped lives lived not for selfish gain or glory, but which point to the Father and love as he loves. Lives that don't repay evil or violence with yet more evil or violence, but know that God's way of weakness and peace overcomes, because nothing Nothing can conquer or overcome the power of God's love. Love which he pours into our lives. A love from which we can never be separated. Love which does not gossip or tear down. Or which is dominated by unforgiveness, creating the fertile ground for bitterness. But lives in which we build each other up as we break bread together, share scripture together, bring a word of encouragement for each other. Lives in which we speak well of each other because we're baptized into Christ, which means that we are one. So when I speak ill of you, I am speaking ill of myself and I am speaking ill of Christ. Build up not tear down. God is still in the business of calling people to himself. To know his steadfast love and grace, to know his love as father, to be brought into his family, 
He calls us to life, to live in Christ, which is true life in all its fullness. Life not just on a Sunday morning, but each day, each moment of every day. And for those of who, us who have been following Jesus for a while, we need to encourage ourselves to keep on, keeping on. Keep allowing the Holy Spirit to reshape us so that we live Jesus' cross-shaped, centered lives. We need to press into and live from the joy of our salvation because that sustains us on the journey. It sustains us when we are in hard places that we inevitably will go to. And as I was preparing for this morning, I felt that God say a number of us have lost that joy. The joy of following Jesus. We're here, we're doing it, but we're like a grumpy teenager with arms folded and a bad attitude. The joy of our salvation has been battered and it's like a flame just holding on. Father God says he loves you. He knows the battles you've been in, the disappointments you've experienced. He's with you. He has not, will not, ever abandon you. Receive his love afresh this morning. Allow his spirit to minister to you. Recall what God has done in your life and from this place of thankfulness, fan into flame the flame of your joy in Jesus. Perhaps you're here this morning and this has all been a bit strange to you. But as you've watched and listened to what has gone on, you've sensed that this is more than just a bunch of nice people doing some weird thing in a tank full of water. But that God is real. That God is here. That he loves you. God this morning calls you to himself. He calls you to live in the freedom that he offers. To not be captive and controlled by the powers of din and say. He calls you to leave a zombie-like existence and live in the fullness that Jesus offers. What does that mean? What does that look like? It looks like accepting what God has done for you in Jesus and committing yourself to learning what it means to live as somebody who follows in his footsteps. And a great first step on that journey is to tell God, that's what I'm doing. I'm in. And we call that prayer. So if that's you this morning, why don't you join me in saying this prayer? You don't need to say it aloud. But I'll pray and you say it in your head and heart. Father God, thank you. Thank you that Jesus, through his death and resurrection, has overcome and defeated the power of death and sin. I choose to turn from living under the power of death and sin to living in Christ. I choose you as my loving Heavenly Father. I choose to live under the rule and lordship of Jesus. I choose to identify with his death. Follow him, empowered by the Holy Spirit to live a life shaped by Jesus. I thank you that you're the God of resurrection. And so I ask that you would fill me now with your resurrection life. I place my full trust in your promise of life forever in your presence at the end of this age. That I will experience the bodily resurrection you promise and know the joy of worshipping you in the new creation. Throw myself wholeheartedly and full time into your way of doing things. Lead me. Guide me, I pray. Amen. If you prayed that this morning, then we'd love to speak to you at the end of the service. God leads us into life. Let's follow him. Thank you for listening to this week's Calling a City to Life talk. We hope that you enjoyed it and that you'll join us again later in the week for the chat. Speak to you again soon. Goodbye.